Well, good morning and uh, welcome to our study of a history of Christianity with Professor Dave Vila, uh, looking at uh, the Oxford professor's uh, kind of magnum opus book, uh, Dimard McCullough's uh, History of Christianity, the first 3,000 years as our text. I'll begin uh, with our collect for today. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose blessed Son was led by the Spirit to be tempted by Satan, come quickly to help us who are salted by many temptations. And as you know the weaknesses of each of us, let each one find you mighty to save through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right, Professor Vila, we'll turn it over to you and uh, my deep gratitude for Dave's uh, being here and, and helping us through understand our history a little bit better. So Dave, all yours. Great, thank you. And I will get things set up here. Okay, well, hello everybody, good morning. It's good to be back. Um, I was looking over the schedule for the rest of the book and there are four chapters left um, after today. And so I think what we're going to do is um, two of those chapters I'm going to combine into one. And so we'll have two more normal sessions. Um, we'll have one session where we'll watch the last video that um, McCullough has put together. And then um, we may have like a final wrap up kind of um, to bring together the whole thing. Uh, you know, what do we do with um, 2000 years of church history or 3000 years of Christianity as McCullough puts it in his book? Um, and where do we go from here? What does the future of the church look like? And, um, you know, what role do we play in that? And what can we learn from uh, kind of the big picture of the history of Christianity? And so that's what we have, probably about three or four more weeks left to go. And, um, and then, um, then we'll see. Okay, um, I want to review quickly what we did last time, just to kind of set the stage for what we're going to do today. And uh, the last bit of last week's lesson we didn't quite get through. And so we'll cover that a little bit more. Um, a little bit more detail. Okay, last time we looked at um, those issues, a Catholic Reformation, cross currents in Spain and Italy, uh, with three people that we talked about. Uh, we didn't get to the Council of Trent, and so we'll talk about the Council of Trent today, and the Roman Catholic Church in the Americas, Asia, and Africa, and then we'll move on to the new material for today. Um, we talked last time about um, it's important to keep in mind when we think about the Protestant Reformation that there are antecedents to that. It didn't come out of nowhere. It didn't just, you know, appear from out of a vacuum. Uh, there were lots of reformers and reform movements within the Christian church, within the Catholic church, uh, long before the Protestant Reformation took place, all the way back to, um, I mean, in some ways, back to the very beginning. Christianity has always been a religion that um, is reforming itself, um, partly because of what we understand about what it means to be human, that we're all fallen. We all tend to, um, you know, to, uh, I don't know, <laughs> we tend to gravitate downwards sometimes, and, um, and we always need reforming and repentance and those sorts of things. And so that's always been a part of uh, Christian faith from the monastic movements in early Christianity, the ascetics who went out, lived in the desert to try to um, renovate both their own lives and the lives of the church uh, to um, the people that are on the screen there, um, Peter Waldo, John Wycliffe, John Huss, Savonarola, and lots of others um, who were reformers all the way leading up to what we call the, the Protestant Reformation. Now, what's a little bit different about these folks is that uh, most of them did not pull away from the great church. They sought to reform it from within. Uh, and that's uh, an important issue that we'll come back to um, a, a few different times. Um, and we talked about these sorts of issues. I'm going to kind of skip over this a little bit. And we may, we'll talk about this more maybe at the very end of things. Um, but then last time we looked at uh, Juan de Valdez, a Spanish uh, Roman Catholic who um, emphasized things that became prominent in the Protestant Reformation, biblical interpretation, Christian piety, and he sought to reform the church from within. Uh, which is important. We talked about uh, Angela Merici and the Ursulines um, and maybe spent um, probably about half an hour, partly because we watched a, a little bit longish video about her and her life. Um, I thought that was important to do partly because um, you know, for worse, not for better or for worse, but for worse, uh, Christian tradition, although um, 
we hearken back to a founder who put people that society says are on the margins. He put them front and center, um, you know, outcasts, children, uh, women, um, uh, people that society tended to look down upon, demon-possessed people, and lots of others. He put those people front and center. Unfortunately, our Christian tradition has done just the opposite frequently um, and have tended to um, marginalize those people and um, and not to give them a space at the table. And so I wanted to make sure and, and uh, remind us that um, throughout the history of our tradition, there have always been um, prominent, uh, powerful, um, influential women like Angela Mirici, who um, has, has an impact even down to today. The Ursa Lines still run uh, orphanages and schools for women. Now many of them are co-ed and colleges that um, continue to impact um, you know, the church in, in some very positive ways. Um, and so it's important to spend a good bit of time uh, talking about her and her impact. Um, whoops. Okay, then we um, uh, kind of ended last time talking about Ignatius Loyola, another Spaniard who was the, the founder, one of the founders of the Jesuits, um, who focused on mission and education and obedience to the Pope as a fourth vow that they took and who also sought to reform the church from within, um, largely through his spiritual exercises, a 28 or 30 day plan for revival in the church. Um, uh, and so uh, there were lots of revival movements within the Roman Catholic tradition, not in a counter reformation, not just responding to Protestants, but just as a part of what the church has always been about. Um, there were some specific responses to the Protestant Reformation, and that's what we come to, actually, this is the, the cave where um, uh, Loyola spent part of his life uh, kind of in retreat. Uh, it looks nice now. It has nice tile floor and marble on the walls and an altar there. Um, and then on the right-hand side is the church of the cave um, in a little town called uh, Manresa um, in northeastern Spain, uh, actually not far from where my family grew up. Um, Okay, uh, then we come to, uh, this is new material that we didn't get to cover last time, but the Council of Trent, um, which was the official Roman Catholic response to uh, the rapid changes that were having with, happening with uh, the, the Protestant Reformation. It did not meet in Rome, as you might have expected, but rather met in Trent, which is in Northern Italy, um, kind of along the Alps up there, not far from Germany, France, um, Italy, uh, are all kind of up there in a, in a in a quadrant, and um, uh, that's maybe significant. I wanted to make sure that um, bishops and priests from as you know as many regions that were affected by the Protestant Reformation, close to Switzerland, also um, were able to attend and were able to um, be a part of the um, the meetings at Trent. It met in three sessions over the, that period of about eight years. Um, attendance was usually about sixty per session, with a high of two hundred seventy-seven. So didn't have the numbers of say a council of Nicaea whose, uh, whose, whose attendance was in the 300s, um, but still was an important gathering of um, Christians that we'll see defined Roman Catholicism for the next uh, 300, almost 400, 300 years. Okay, and it was clearly an open and openly a response to the Protestant Reformation and things that were happening in Germany and France and Switzerland, um, and even in places like Spain, where there were Reformation movements that were going on. Um, and it re reasserted traditional Roman Catholic beliefs and rituals in some ways that we'll, we'll talk about in just a minute. And it defined the Roman Catholic Church until the Vatican I meeting that took place in 1869 to 1870. And then after that, we'll come to the last major um, uh, council that the Roman Catholic Church has held was Vatican II, the met in the 1960s, late 1960s, um, uh, where some pretty radical changes took place um, uh, in Roman Catholicism that defined it in some very new ways. Okay, some of the things that, that um, uh, the council was about, um, they did meet to condemn the beliefs and doctrines of the Protestants that they saw as heretical and as dangerous. Um, they met to reform the administration of the church in some very specific ways, such as uh, reformation or reform that, that um, dealt with indulgences and with the morality of convents um, and, and monasteries, the education of the clergy, making sure that clergy were trained to do what they, what they needed to do, um, the non-residents of bishops, bishops who would be a bishop of a city but would live, you know, in, an, in another city far away uh, because they didn't want to be bothered with um, 
the work of the bishopric, um, but they still took the income from, from the bishopric. Um, and those sorts of things are uh, issues that the church struggled with that needed reform, and that's one of the things that the, the council wanted to deal with. Also affirmed the church as the ultimate interpreter of the Bible um, over against the Protestants who were saying now that um, anyone guided by the spirit uh, can be a legitimate interpreter of the Bible um, in the common language also. Um, and it defined the relationship of faith and works and salvation in ways that we'll talk more about in just a minute. And then reaffirm the ritual practices, practice of indulgence, the veneration of Mary, pilgrimage relics, and those sorts of things, many of which the Protestants also had um, significant issues with. So as the, um, some of the decrees of the council that reaffirmed the Nicene Creed, which is important. Um, you know, the Nicene Creed in some ways um, is kind of the, the, the foundation of Christian faith. Um, uh, we recite it every Sunday here at, at Grace, and um, uh, it kind of covers the, the fundamentals of what um, Christian faith is all about. Uh, and so it reaffirms that we are, for them, not just a Christian church, but the Christian church. Um, uh, and so it reaffirms the Nicene Creed, that, that's important. Um, uh, they affirm the deuterocanonical books as equal to scripture and the Vulgate as the authoritative version. Nowadays, not many Catholics would hold that. The deuterocanonical books are things like First and Second Maccabees or um, Bell and the Dragon or Tobit or others that appear in, in most Roman Catholic Bibles, they appear in the middle. Uh, and so there'll be the Old Testament, the deuterocanonical books, and then the New Testament. And those deuter deuterocanonical books are historical books and um, tales and fables from the intertestamental period that, um, that instruct and, and show godly living and faithful life, what it looked like in, in that time period. Most Protestants don't have them in, in, in our Bibles, um, uh, but they are uh, interesting to read and important to read to understand the intertestamental period. Um, but they were affirmed as, as scripture um, at Trent. Um, uh, also, justification was defined as um, uh, a cooperative act between human operation and, um, and divine grace. Um, so it wasn't uh, only by faith, only by grace. It was humans cooperating with God's divine grace. Um, and that is one position that's been uh, prominent throughout the history of the Christian church. There have been people, uh, Roman Catholic theologians long before, um, that tended to emphasize less on the human cooperation side and more on the divine grace side. And it's a continuum. Um, uh, it has been, you know, the entirety of Christian tradition. Um, and maybe... Maybe one of the more significant things, at least in practical terms, that, that the, the Council of Trent dealt with was with the sacraments, with the sacraments, and the Eucharist was, um, uh, you know, um, they didn't announce this. They affirmed that the, the the Eucharist is a propitiatory sacrifice. That is, it's a bloodless sacrifice, and so Jesus really is um, dying and and. Um, uh, being sacrificed as the priest prays and consecrates the, the elements. Um, uh, there was a reaffirmation of transubstantiation that, that many of the Protestants rejected, that the, the, um, that the bread and the wine do become uh, literally, but not uh, in form, uh, the body and blood of Jesus. Um, uh, they reaffirmed a withholding of the cup from the laity. And so everyday common people uh, would only take of the bread, not of, not of the wine. Uh, which seems maybe strange to, to some of us. Um, and uh, significantly, ordination was determined to be a permanent um, status. And so once um, an, a man is ordained uh, to the clergy, um, that's not something that can be undone. It's a permanent thing. And so if uh, a man goes from being a priest to a bishop to a cardinal or whatever, um, it's a reaffirmation of the ordination at each step. Uh, he's not reordained uh, and he, ne he never loses that ordination. Uh, that's a curious thing. And even holds in some ways down to today where um, uh, when I was in graduate school, my um, a doctoral advisor was a former Jesuit priest. Um, uh, he was a Jesuit priest and taught at a Jesuit university where I did my degree um, for about 15 years and um, met a very beautiful young nun uh, who he fell in love with and they fell in love with each other and decided to get married. And so um, he 
stopped practicing as a priest and she stopped practicing as a nun and they became husband and wife. They got married and they've been married now for 30 years. Uh, he emailed me the other day just to chat. Um, but the Roman Catholic Church still considers him a Jesuit priest and he will always be a Jesuit priest until the day he dies. Um, so it's kind of a curious, and she will always be a nun until the day that she dies. And so it's a curious thing. We have a married nun and a married priest together uh, because the ordination is permanent. Um, as was decided at Trent. Um, anyways, uh, and another very significant thing that we, we wouldn't tend to think about a whole lot, but in practical, pra practical terms is very important was that marriage was declared to be valid um, only if it was before a priest and two witnesses. Okay. Um, and if we were in a, in a group setting, I would ask, well, why would that be significant? What's, what's the big deal about that? Um, uh, remember, the Protestants broke away from the church, and so they were married not by priests. Uh, they were married by, maybe by their pastor, maybe by somebody else, um, uh, but the, the marriage was not performed by a priest. In the eyes of the Roman Catholic Church, therefore, all those Protestant marriages were not valid. Those people were living in sin and in, in, um, in fornication or whatever, um, because they were not officially married as a sacrament by a priest uh, by the church. And so largely in result of that, uh, Protestants tended to treat marriage not as a sacrament, but as a um, as a, a civil ordinance or a civil civil ordinance, I guess is maybe the best way to look at it. Um, and that had some positives and negatives. Uh, the positives of uh, treating marriage not as a sacrament, but as a civil ordinance was that it meant that um, not only could all marriages be acknowledged as legitimate, whether they're Christian or Buddhist or pagan or whatever, um, two people can be legitimately married, uh, even if they're not Christians and not married by priests, not part of the church. And so uh, that opened up the, uh, the, the legitimacy of marriage far beyond uh, what it was held to be by the Roman Catholic Church at this time. Uh, but it also meant that it was a desacralization of marriage and marriage was treated, um, you know, as a kind of a, almost a common law sort of thing um, and wasn't treated as, um, you know, a sacramental uh, religious uh, thing that the church had um, control over. Um, and oddly enough, this affected my own family with um, uh, my, my family legend is that we were Jews who migrated from the Middle East to Spain in the Middle Ages. Uh, at the Inquisition, uh, we became good Roman Catholics. Uh, uh, and then eventually, in sometime in the 18th, 1850s or so, 1840s, um, my family was converted to um, become Protestants, Methodists, um, by some Methodist missionaries who came from England to Spain uh, and um, preached the gospel. My family converted. Um, uh, that continued for several generations down to my grandfather's time when, um, and when he and his wife got married in northeastern Spain um, in the early 20th century. Spain was a very Roman Catholic country uh, that only recognized marriages performed by the Catholic Church. And so uh, my grandfather and grandmother, who also happened to be first cousins, uh, they were both, their last name was both Vila. <laughs> and so it was um, Samuel Vila and Lydia Vila got married. And so my dad became David Vila Vila is what it is in Spanish. But anyways, um, when they got married, um, it was not done by um, uh, the Roman Catholic Church uh, and Protestants in Spain also didn't wear wedding rings because wedding rings were seen as something that was part of the Roman Catholic ritual and um, Protestants didn't use wedding rings. And so when my grandfather and grandmother, uh, after they got married, they went up to France, which is just across the border from where they lived um, for their honeymoon. And they went to check into the hotel that they, the little, little kind of hostel hotel type thing that they were gonna stay at. And um, they wouldn't let them check in because they didn't have a wedding certificate from the church and they weren't wearing wedding rings. And um, the owner of the hotel just thought that this was some, uh, some renegade Protestant pastor with his floozy uh, trying to go get a weekend at a hotel uh, across the border in France. And so they wouldn't let him get a hotel room. And so I think they ended up staying with, uh, with an evangelical family, a Protestant family uh, across the border up in France. But, um, you know, uh, their marriage wasn't considered valid because it wasn't done by a priest, even down to the early 20th century. Uh, and that came out of um, 
uh, the decrees of the Council of Trent. And so I'm curious, that something that we wouldn't normally think about probably had a tremendous impact on um, a large segment of the population as they tried to figure out, well, what do we do if, if what, what, is, what is marriage even? Um, Anyways, they also at the Council of Trent came up with the Index of Forbidden Books. That was a list of books that um, uh, good Catholic Christians were not supposed to read um, and were forbidden from reading, which is a curious thing because now with the, the, the Gutenberg Press, um, books were being disseminated all around Europe and especially the books of these renegade Protestants were um, wreaking havoc as they were printed, you know, many copies and spread all over Europe. And so the church came up, came up with the index of forbidden books that um, people weren't supposed to read. And oddly enough, again, in my graduate studies at St. Louis University Jesuit School, um, I, I spent a lot of my time studying Islam. And I remember one day I opened up an older copy of the Quran and I noticed that inside the middle of the Quran, there was a little slip of paper that was a permission slip for a young priest to check out this book from the library. He had permission, permission from the bishop, I think, to check out this book from the library uh, and read it and study it. Uh, and that was because the, the Quran was on the Index of for, Forbidden Books up until Vatican II. And this permission slip was from the 1950s or so. And so the priest, the young priest had to get permission uh, from his superior in order to check out a copy of the Quran from the um, library because it was on the Index of Forbidden Books. Now, I think there still is such a thing, but no one pays any attention to it anymore. People read whatever they want. Okay, now um, one of the things that happened also in this time period with the global expansion that took place in the early 16th century is um, the spread of Roman Catholicism all over uh, the world um, through trade and through um, colonization. And so the Portuguese and the Spanish colonized Africa and Latin America, especially uh, the Christian mission to East Asia um, was already in, in, in swing in the 14th century, century, but was revitalized in the 16th century with Jesuit missions in China, the Philippines, and elsewhere. Um, and so let me ask you a question, um, and uh, feel free to chime in if you want to, or I can just answer. But um, most, the most populous Roman Catholic nations in the world today, um, what do you think is the most populous, uh, the Roman Catholic nation in the world with the highest number of um, Roman Catholic Christians in it. Any ideas? And if you want to, if you want to chat, that's fine, or you can just talk or number one is Brazil with 140 million um, uh, Roman Catholic Christians, partly because the population of Brazil is very big. It's a big country, um, but also because the Jesuits went down there and um, found the churches and schools and universities and orphanages and institutions that, um, you know, it's the largest um, Roman Catholic nation is not a European nation. Second is Mexico, maybe not surprising. Mexico also has a large number of Protestants, but um, uh, 100 million uh, Roman Catholic Christians in Mexico. Third is the Philippines with 85 million. And again, the Jesuits went to um, uh, uh, on mission there. The Jesuits saw their primary uh, reason for existing was on missions and education. And so 85 million Roman Catholic Christians in the Philippines. The United States was 70 million. And we're, we haven't gotten a European country on the map yet. I mean, on the, on, the, on the chart yet. And finally, Italy with 50 million. But maybe even more surprising than that is um, the Democratic Republic of the Congo with 50 million. There is many Roman Catholic Christians in the Congo as there are in Italy. And that's a shocking thing. That's a surprising thing. Uh, but it is largely because of these missions that took place in the 16th century. Now, if you've read, um, uh, Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, you know that, you know, the colonization of um, Africa was a horrific thing, you know, just terrible, horrible, and of the Americas as well. Um, but, you know, I don't know, what do you do? There's, um, uh, we condemn that, but there is um, lots of Christians that have arisen as a result of the, the colonization of those areas, um, not to justify the atrocities that happened at all, but um, just to comment. Okay, okay. Now we're to um, things that are that are going to be new for today, um, and we change gears somewhat. Um, you know, if up until now we've been talking about the Roman Catholic Church and its place in the 16th century, uh, responding to in many ways the um, 
the change that took place with the Protestant Reformation. Uh, we're going to look in a little, little different angle on this on this whole thing. Now, throughout the Middle Ages, authority was um, largely vested with institutions, primarily with the church, um, was seen as the um, the vehicle through which. Um, you know, authority was given to politicians or uh, to bishops and, and rulers within the church. Authority was largely seen as something that was located in the past. And so one looks back to the past, to those who've gone before uh, for, uh, as the source of authority. And authority was assumed to derive from external uh, supernatural sources um, in many ways throughout the Middle Ages. That's, um, that's an appropriate way to think about this sort of thing. With um, the, the, the coming of the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, lots of radical changes took place that are going to shape Christianity even down to our own day in some very dramatic ways, ways that in some ways are very healthy, other ways are uh, not so healthy, and we'll look at some of those in a little bit. But in part, uh, the movement of Turkic, tr Turkic tribes um, into Anatolia, what's today modern day Turkey, pushing Greek speakers to Italy and the West, um, helped bring about some of the changes that took place in, in especially Italy, but in other places in Europe as well. The presence of Muslim, Christian, and Jewish interchange in Spain, in places like Seville and Cordoba, and um, other places where Aristotle and Greek sciences flourished um, in the, the, the late Middle Ages, also um, helped to bring about some of the changes with the Renaissance and uh, Reformation and Enlightenment. Uh, the rise of cities and nations, uh, the notions of nation states and tension with the institutional church. And we've talked about that, and actually talked about that in, in his last session as well. Um, was something, a, a, a big social change that was taking place um, in this time period. The rise of the middle class of merchants and traders also changed the face of um, society uh, in the time period leading up to the Reformation. Um, the global expansion and exploration of the new world uh, brought about radical changes as well. Um, uh, advances in the sciences with Galileo and lots of others um, uh, brought about radical changes. Gutenberg's printing press and the dissemination of the printed page uh, brought about radical changes. And the rise of Renaissance humanism with, with um, focus on broader understandings of human being or being human, uh, looking to classical antiquity as well as early Christianity for renewal of Christian faith is another feature of all of this that kind of brings it all together in some ways. So, for example, um, this is Raphael's School of Athens, which um, is actually on in the Vatican, on in one of the bedroom, one of the Pope's bedrooms. Um, it's not used as a bedroom anymore, of course, but in one of the bedrooms in the Papal Palace, there, um, you look over on the wall, and there is Raphael's School of Athens. Um, can you imagine having something like this on on your bedroom wall? Um, I got some pictures from my daughter, which are at least as, as beautiful as this, uh, but. Um, I don't know. And um, that's, you can see the, the squinch in the top left and top right of the corner. That's the corner of the room. And then that archway there um, is an archway and painted into the back of the arch is, um, is the painting right on the wall. And down at the bottom, that's not painting, that's, um, that's a marble decoration and panels on the bottom there with the painting in the background. And one of the curious things about this painting is that um, there are Maimonides is in there, um, uh, Ibn Rushd, the Veroese, the Muslim philosophers in there, Avicenna, the Muslim philosophers in there. All of uh, classical antiquity um, is painted in this painting as well, bringing together all these sources of wisdom as, um, uh, uh, as legitimate sources for informing uh, this, these new understandings of what it meant to be human. And if you look particularly right in the middle there are the two big boys on the left and the red is um, Plato, who's pointing his finger upward to the heavens and saying, uh, the source of all truth is not found down here in the physical material world. The source, ultimate source of truth is found above in the world of forms, the world of the ideal. Uh, on the right hand in the blue is Aristotle, of course, who has his hand facing downward saying, no, uh, truth is never ab abstracted uh, in, in the other world. It's always found concretely manifested here in the world below. And so um, uh, th and those two views are going to play an important role in the development of, uh, of, have played an important role in the development of Christianity, but um, uh, it's interesting that they get depicted here uh, right in the center, the center stage of the, the School of Athens. 
Two other examples of um, art from the period are um, Albrecht Dürer's um, paint self-portrait on the left and Michelangelo's David on the right. Uh, Michelangelo's David is, of course, um, a, a biblical figure, but now presented not so much as a character in a narrative from the Bible, but rather as uh, a Greco-Roman sculpture um, uh, in form and style, very much uh, uh, an example of, um, you know, the, the revivi revivification of ancient Greece and Rome. Um, then on the left, that, that portrait of Albrecht Dürer. Um, up until this point, most, por most portraits, when they did occur, uh, were from the side. Uh, but to have a portrait um, of an individual uh, looking straight on in the face is a relatively new invention um, in the, the Renaissance period. Over on the left, it says uh, 1500, the year he painted it, and then AD, uh, whether that's Albrecht Dürer or Anno Domini uh, is. I'm not sure. Um, and then on the right hand side, it says um, Albert, Albrecht Dürer of Nuremberg painted this painting in uh, indelible colors. Um, and then a few other things after that. But um, very curious now that we have a, a secular painting of an individual um, in portrait kind of abstracted from any scene behind him. Um, as a, a major new way of looking at um, art in, in um, and we'll see that even affected in this next painting, uh, Leonardo da Vinci's Salvator Mundi, um, which is a very, very curious painting for so many reasons. Um, uh, this painting was discovered in um, uh, 1958 when it sold at auction for uh, uh, about $100. Um, they didn't know it was a da Vinci at the time. It was just an old painting that was in very bad shape. Um, and someone bought it at auction for about $100. Um, in 2017, uh, the same painting, now restored and recognized as a legitimate uh, da Vinci, sold for $450 million. Um, and so you think about the poor guy, <laughs> the poor guy who sold it for 100 bucks, and it ended up going for uh, half a billion dollars almost. Um, but again, so many curious things about this painting. Um, it looks like a secular portrait. It's no longer a narrative from Jesus' life. It's not a scene of the crucifixion. It's not a scene of turning water into wine at Cana. It's not a scene of the birth of Jesus. Is Jesus presented as a secular portrait without any scene in the background, without any narrative that, that talks about his life and times and what he did? Um, very almost identical to the Dürer uh, uh, painting. And actually with the Dürer, some people look at the, the way his hands are presented there as um, invoking a sign of blessing, uh, not unlike what Jesus is doing here. Um, although I don't, I don't know about that and I'm not, not sure, but um, anyways, um, so we get even religious art that's being presented um, with a lone individual abstracted from time and space and geography. Um, how would this painting have been used as an object of devotion maybe or uh, but still it's a jesus who's abstracted from time and space which is a very curious thing uh, for our incarnational faith that god comes down and dwells in space and time uh, this is a very strange painting but um worth a lot of money too anyways Okay, now some of the impact of um, these sorts of changes on Christianity um, are among Roman Catholics, um, uh, all these changes that took place led to the reformation of abuses, you know, with indulgences, clerical morality, amnesty bishops, and so forth, also led to a reaffirmation of traditional values, both moral and theological. All of those are good things um, uh, in many ways. Among Protestants, one of the things that came out of all of this was an emphasis on the role of the individual um, in, in a number of different ways that we'll talk about in just a minute. And a return ad fontes to the fountain, to the origins of uh, Christian faith, um, which is, again, something that Christianity has always done to a greater or lesser extent, but um, maybe happened on steroids here at this point in um, uh, in the Christian tradition. But we want to be careful when we think about this because any return to 
the fountain, to the origin, to the source of Christian faith, always does so. It's any any return to the fundamentals of a Christian faith of the Christian faith, always does so sit from a place situated in time and space. Um, we never go back to uh, the early church as the early church is. Now, in many ways, we do that better than any generation that's come before us, in part because of um, so many discoveries, discoveries in archaeology and history and anthropology that help us to understand the origins of Christianity in ways that people up until now just didn't. Um, but nonetheless, we always see that past from where we stand right here and right now. Um, we never see it as it is, you know, abstracted from space and time. And so one example of that is um, John Calvin's thinking on the atonement. I was raised in Presbyterian Reformed churches as a child. I went to Presbyterian high school, Presbyterian college, Presbyterian seminary, where I got two degrees. And so John Calvin was always someone who was very prominent um, in uh, the way that I understood and was taught to understand the world to be. But notice, for example, um, Calvin's thinking on the atonement, on Jesus' death and resurrection, and how that is primarily to be understood. So, for example, on the left there, the second requirement of our reconciliation with God was this, that man who by his disobedience had become lost should, by way of remedy, counter it with obedience, satisfy God's judgment, and pay the penalties for sin. Accordingly, our Lord came forth as true man and took the person in the name of Adam in order to take Adam's place in obeying the Father, to present our flesh as the price of satisfaction to God's righteous judgment, and in the same flesh to pay the penalty that we had deserved. And that's from Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion. Or from his commentary on Romans 8.34, as no one by accusing can prevail when the judge absolves, so there remains no condemnation when satisfaction is given to the laws and the penalty is already paid. Now Christ is he who, having once for all suffered the punishment due to us, thereby declared that he undertook our cause in order to deliver us. He then who seeks, to, seeks hereafter to condemn us must kill Christ himself again. But he has not only died, but also came forth by a resurrection as the conqueror of death and triumphed over all its power. Now, when you look at these two statements on the atonement, there's a theme that runs through both of them that's very prominent, um, and that is the theme of God as a judge and human beings living under the condemnation of the law. When you think about that judge and law and uh, paying the penalty that, uh, that we were condemned under the law, um, you think, well, why does Calvin approach the, the issue of atonement um, through this particular way of understanding? And it's partly because uh, in some ways that type of view is found in the Christian scriptures, uh, but it's more than that. Does anybody know what um, Calvin's pr profession was before he joined you know, into the Reformation movement, um, what he studied to be and trained to be? Anybody know what Calvin's uh, uh, trained to be? No, go ahead. A lawyer, you know, he trained to be a lawyer. He studied law as a humanist lawyer um, at two different universities outside of Paris when he was um, uh, in his younger days. Originally, his father wanted him to be a priest, but then realized that he'd be able to make more money as a lawyer. And so um, he went uh, to two universities outside of Paris and studied law. And so it's not surprising when Calvin looks at the scriptures, what does he see? He sees law. He sees God as a judge and um, the satisfaction of the law being met through the death and resurrection of Jesus, which is there, but maybe not the only way of viewing things in the Bible. But nonetheless, he went back to the original source, but he saw it through the lens of who he was and where he was and um, his way of viewing the world. And that, that's a common thing. Um, you know, it comes up in my teaching at JBU all the time when students will, um, in a class on the New Testament or Old Testament or whatever, will, will run, want to write a paper on, um, you know, money in the early church. And they'll want to go in there and um, what, they, what they want to find and what they tend to find is that um, when you study what money and wealth was in the early church period, uh, they find free market capitalism is the way that money was, was viewed in the um, 
uh, in the in the first century, and that's not the case at all. But you know, we go in there with certain mindset, thinking, well, this is the true way, and so we go back. But when you read things like Acts chapter two, where the Christians lived together and had everything in common, they gave all their possessions to each other and put it in the middle. They took what they needed, gave what they had. Um, it sounds a lot more like Bernie than it does like uh, free market capitalism, and so. Um, you know, how you can read that passage and see free market capitalism is, you know, kind of a curious thing. But anyways, um, that's important to keep in mind as we think about um, when we disengage ourselves from the broader church and approach things as individuals going back to the source, we always do so from a particular time and place. And so we want to be careful um, as, as we do that. And we'll talk about that more in just a minute. Uh, and maybe the culmination of all of this was um, a uh, philosopher who was a deeply Christian person uh, named Rene Descartes. And uh, this quote from Rene, Rene Descartes kind of uh, from his discourse on method kind of summarizes everything that, that the, the Enlightenment has been about up until now. Uh, he said, I, entertain, I entirely abandoned the study of letters, the study of books, things that have, were said before, resolving to seek no knowledge other than that of which could be found in myself or else in the great book of the world. I spent the rest of my youth traveling, visiting courts and armies, mixing with people of diverse temperaments and ranks, and gathering various experiences, testing myself in the situations which which fortune offered me, and at all times ref reflecting upon whatever came my way to derive some profit from it. So now Descartes says, I'm going to forget about everything that's happened before me, everything that was written before me, and I'm going to go out and I'm going to discern the truth all by myself. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, that's a curious thing. What we're going to do now for just a couple minutes, um, and it's just a short video, but it's a little video about uh, uh, Descartes, and then we're going to break down some of the um, some of the issues that come up in it. So here we go. René Descartes was a French 17th century philosopher, famous above all for saying, I think, therefore I am but worthy of our attention for many reasons beyond this. What makes him stand out is that he was a fierce rationalist. In an age when many philosophers still backed up their arguments with appeals to God, Descartes trusted in nothing more than the human power of logic. This is how he defiantly kicked off his book, Rules for the Direction of the Mind. I shall bring to light the true riches of our souls, opening up to each of us the means whereby we can find within ourselves, without any help from anyone else, all the knowledge that we may need for the conduct of life. Descartes had immense faith in what introspection, guided by definition, sound argument, and clarity of thought, could achieve. He believed that much of what was wrong with the world was caused by misusing our minds, by confusion, bad definition, and unconscious illogicality. His life was an attempt to make our minds better equipped for the task of thinking. To solve key questions, Descartes proposed that one always had to divide large problems into small, understandable sections by way of incisive questions. This is what he called his method of doubts. We get muddled by certain questions like, what's the meaning of life or what is love? Because we're not careful enough about how we break these big inquiries down. He described the method of doubts as akin to having a large barrel of apples where good ones are mixed with bad ones. To be a philosopher means a commitment to sorting out the entire barrel, to inspecting each apple individually and throwing away all the bad ones to ensure only those of the best quality are left. Another way to think about Descartes, and this explains why he would, among other things, turn out to be such a hero to the leaders of the French Revolution, is that he believed in grounding all of our ideas in individual experience and reason rather than authority and tradition. In his greatest book, Discourse on the Method, published in 1637, he explained how he'd come to write it. A long time ago, I entirely abandoned the study of letters, resolving to seek no knowledge other than that which could be found in myself or else in the great book of the world. I spent my youth traveling, visiting courts and armies, mixing with people of diverse temperaments and ranks, gathering various experiences, testing myself in situations which fortune afforded me, and at all times reflecting personally upon whatever came my way so as to derive some profit from it. 
Descartes spent a large part of his adult life away from his native France in the Dutch Republic, since he held the belief, not entirely unwisely, that the mercantile Dutch would, as a people, be far too concerned with earning money to pester a free-thinking man like himself. However, it turned out that the Dutch were a little less materialistic than he'd hoped, and the philosopher ended up moving 24 times to keep ahead of spies and government agents. Descartes' subjective approach to philosophy reached its climax when he arrived at the famous phrase, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. The phrase first appeared in French, je pense, donc je suis, in the Discourse on the Method, before then appearing in Latin in The Principles of Philosophy of 1644. It was intended to be Descartes' ultimate answer to a question that philosophers sometimes get perhaps unreasonably interested in, namely, how can one know that anything, including oneself, actually exists rather than being some sort of dream or phantasm? On his quest for certainty around this question of whether it might all be a dream, Descartes began by observing that our human senses are deeply unreliable. He couldn't, for example, he said, be trusted to know whether he was actually sitting in a room in his dressing gown next to a fire or merely dreaming of such a thing. But there was one thing he could know for sure. He could trust that he was actually thinking. His existence could be proved by a neat tautological trick. He could not be thinking and wondering if he existed if he did not exist. Therefore, his thinking was a very basic proof of his being, or to return to the maxim, I think, therefore I am. This might not sound like a huge insight, but Descartes used it as an Archimedean point in an epistemologically unsteady world. With this certainty safely banked, Descartes argued that his mind could go on to discover other similarly irrefutable truths. Some of the charm of Descartes' work comes from his entwining of personal details along with more arid philosophical passages. He tells us, for example, that his revolutionary idea came to him during the winter of 1619, when he'd escaped the fierce cold of the Low Countries by hopping into a stove and spending the whole day meditating inside. Descartes epitomizes the solitary end of philosophy. One can, in his eyes, solve the most profound problems by searching deep within oneself. Teams of individuals or ideas passed through generations, as they are in universities, are deeply suspect for Descartes. Philosophers don't need gangs of scientists using expensive equipment, unheard of terminology, and huge data sets. They just need a quiet room and a rational mind. At another point, Descartes recounts that he mocked friends of his who once showed up at his home at 11 in the morning and were surprised to find him still in bed. What are you doing? They inquired skeptically. Thinking, Descartes replied. The group was stunned, but Descartes criticized them in turn for privileging often nonsensical practical tasks over the beauty of pure, quiet reflection in bed. In 1649, Descartes finished another great work, Passions of the Soul. It was the outcome of six years of correspondence with a royal acquaintance, the Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia, who was a keen amateur philosopher and a rather emotional and turbulent soul. She had written to Descartes begging him to write about passions in order that she might get to know and control her own more clearly. Descartes obliged, thinking that the ancient philosophers had done a poor job of analysing the passions and that ordinary and not so ordinary people would benefit immensely from another look at the topic. He therefore opened the passions of the soul with a characteristic claim. I shall be obliged to write just as if I were considering a topic that no one had dealt with before me. The work provides a beautiful taxonomy of pretty much any passion one might feel, as well as descriptions of their causes, effects, and functions. This is followed by another section called The Discipline of Virtue, a manual of advice on how we can control our passions and enjoy a virtuous life. Descartes identified six fundamental passions, wonder, love, hatred, desire, joy, and sadness. From these, there followed in his eyes an unlimited number of specific passions, combinations of the original ones. Descartes didn't believe in vanquishing passions, as the ancient Stoic philosophers had proposed, merely in learning how to identify them in oneself and understand their impact on one's behavior. He would have been very sympathetic to psychotherapy. He believed that a key task of being a philosopher was to help people understand and therefore control their passions, that is, become a little less anxious, status-driven, scared, or inclined to fall head over heels in love with inappropriate people. He was optimistic about how much progress we could make psychologically. Even those who have the weakest souls can acquire absolute mastery over their passions if they work hard enough at training and guiding them.
Descartes' psychological and philosophical work attracted ever more powerful admirers. In 1646, Queen Christina of Sweden got interested in sorting out issues in her mind and began a correspondence with Descartes. She even persuaded the philosopher to move to Sweden to tutor her in passion and philosophy in 1649. However, the early working hours required, the Queen could only make time for lessons at 5 a.m., and the harsh cold soon made Descartes ill. He died of pneumonia in 1650 at the age of 53. To remember Descartes by I think therefore I am is perhaps not as shallow as one might initially have presumed. The sentence does truly capture something important about him and the task of philosophy in general. It signals a commitment to working through emotional confusion, prejudice and unhelpful tradition in order to arrive at an independent, rationally founded vision of existence. Okay. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about some of the things that um, that came up with Descartes. You know, Descartes uh, says in his um, uh, in his writings that his goal was absolute certainty of knowledge. He wanted to know something without any sh shred of doubt, and so he thought he would doubt everything that he possibly could, um, and whatever he came up with at the very end would be the grounding for what he believed. Um, and one thing that that can't be doubted is that he's doubting and thinking. And then that's as the video explained, uh, because I'm thinking I must exist. Um, now, uh, oddly enough, uh, Ray Descartes was a very devout Roman Catholic and a very religious person. He wasn't a, a secular atheist philosopher or anything like that. And he argued that one of the ideas um, that are in me, uh, of all the ideas that are in me, the idea that I have of God is the most true, the most clear and distinct, he said, um, and because he assumed that God, uh, to be God, is benevolent, uh, we can have some trust that the external world really exists as it appears to me using scientific experimentation to verify. So part of what one of the first things that Descartes wanted to do with after he came to the conclusion that um, I think therefore I exist was because I'm thinking uh, one of the clearest ideas to me is that there is a benevolent God out there. And because there's a benevolent God, therefore the external world must um, in some form exist. Uh, and I can verify that using scientific experiments. Um, and so he did want to prove the existence of God um, and did so in, in the way that I just kind of outlined there. Now, to think about Descartes in this kind of culmination of um, the Renaissance and Reformation Enlightenment thing, uh, we want to think about this uh, a little bit. Um, one issue that comes to the fore right away, and hopefully you you, you thought of this or noticed this as we as we um, as we talked about things, um, the radical individualism of the Renaissance and Reformation that reaches its natural conclusion in Rene Descartes is deeply opposed to much of what our Christian faith holds about who we fundamentally are as a church. We are a body first, not primarily individuals who gather on occasion on occasion gather. Uh, we live together, we work together, we worship together, we cry together, we live and die together um, as a body. And uh, the radical individualism of um, the Reformation and the Enlightenment uh, culminating in Descartes uh, runs counter to that. Um, and then the second issue is um, what I think is kind of the arrogance of the individualism of um, uh, the type of approach that D Descartes took. And that is Bernardo Chart used to compare us to dwarfs perched on the shoulders of giants. He pointed out that we see more and farther than our predecessors, not because we have keener vision or greater height, but because we are lifted up and borne aloft on their gigantic stature. You know, uh, we understand the world better because of those who've gone before us. Uh, we see more clearly, we see farther because we are part, um, not just an individual uh, standing all alone, but because we build on those who've gone before us and we can learn from those who've gone before us. And to think otherwise, I don't know, to me seems incredibly arrogant. Um, but I don't know. So maybe two lessons for uh, for us as we think about the, the um, what came out of the Reformation Enlightenment. One is uh, to be mindful that um, individualism is, uh, I think in some ways a dangerous thing uh, for us who consider ourselves to be a body. Um, and secondly, uh, that we wanna avoid the arrogance of thinking that um, we can't learn from those who've gone before. Um, there's much that we can learn from people who think differently from us, who lived in different days and times from us. Um, and I think we, we ought to be open to those sorts of things. 
Okay, that's the uh, little moral for the day uh, based on, on the lesson for today. Uh, any comments or, or questions or from anybody? Either in the chat or make sure people are still here. Any comments, anybody? Okay, well then uh, we'll just continue working through the McCullough book for next time. Uh, I hope in some way this has been beneficial to you. And, um, and if not, please feel free to, to contact me and let me know how things can be improved or, or uh, made more relevant or whatever, but uh, anyways. Okay, thank you everybody. Thank you, Dave. Wonderful job. And we'll look for everyone uh, next week.